Hi, I'm Brandon Leonard, Director of Strategic Initiatives with Men's Health Network. And today I'm speaking with Dr. Jean Bonhomme, who is President of the National Black Men's Health Network and member of the Board of Advisors for Men's Health Network. Dr. Bonhomme, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, your career has really been defined in many ways by your focus on men's health. Can you tell us what first brought you into that area? Well, the biggest thing that brought me into the area initially was the recognition that African American men in the 1980s were not living long enough to collect, to collect Medicare or Social Security. And it was surprising to me that nobody was wanting to do much about that. I grew up in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, literally across the street from where Mike Tyson grew up. Although I'm, he was much younger than me, I never met him. But uh, the thing about it was I was watching people die for all kinds of reasons, violence, uh, suicide, drug overdoses, and things of that nature. It, I grew up really feeling afraid a lot of the time because it was a very dangerous place to be. But again, you know, society seemed very indifferent to it. So I started looking at the issues of, you know, why African American black men uh, were not keeping pace in terms of life expectancy with other groups. And what surprised me was that most people would just attribute it to racism, but I found that a lot of it had to do with African American men's gender roles as well, being taught to be stoic, being told to do dangerous labor, being not being taught to take care of ourselves. And the gender roles were very much involved in that, uh, in that reduction of life expectancy that we see in this group, unfortunately. Why do you think men's health hasn't received as much mainstream attention as women's health, for example? Well, in the course of my trying to promote African-American men's health and realizing that it was tied very strongly to men's health in general, there was a lot of misguided political opposition. A lot of people seemed to feel as though if you focused on men, you were going to somehow take away something from women and children. And I think that the failure to focus on men is taking away from women and children. In September 2002, I got a call from my next door neighbor in the middle of the night that she couldn't wake her husband up. And I went to see him and he seemed to be conscious but unable to move or speak and his pupils were widely dilated. I rode the ambulance to the emergency room with him and we worked on him and he died the following morning. As it turned out, he had had a massive stroke in the back of his brain. And, and I looked at some pictures of him a few months before he died and one of his pupils was dilated and the other was normal. So this stroke was evolving for a very long time and nobody picked up on it, including the patient. He told his wife when he was holding his head the day before he died that, uh, you know, leave me alone, I'll be all right. So the, fa so the fact is that women are profoundly affected by the health of men. Uh, African-American women are in grave danger of HIV because the infection rate of, of uh, African-American men in HIV is so high. Uh, when women, like this particular woman, she lost her companion of 32 years. She had to deal with bereavement. She had to deal with financial deprivation without his job. The whole of society suffers because when men, because men die prematurely, unnecessarily become disabled. There's diminished work productivity. There's absenteeism. There's employers having to, having to train new people because somebody fell ill or somebody got hurt or somebody got killed. And the, and the, all the, of the economics of society is affected by by men's health. Children are affected by it. We now know because of a type of inheritance that called epigenetic inheritance that a man who is exposed to a chemical he might not get cancer but his children might because the way his genes are regulated was affected by that chemical when he passes it on to his children so we'll never stop birth defects if we don't focus on men's health mm -hmm. we'll never fo we'll never stop sexually transmitted diseases in women if we don't focus on men's health a lot of sexually transmitted diseases are much more devastating in women than they are in men. Human papillomavirus causes cervical cancer in women. If a woman has genital herpes and she's about to give birth, they have to do a C-section because uh, the baby cannot pass through the birth canal and be exposed to herpes. It can be very deadly for them. If a woman has uh, chlamydia, it can render her sterile. Uh, you know, so the point is that a lot of the sexually transmitted diseases are more devastating to women than are to men. How are you going to stop that if you don't pay attention to men? So what I started to realize not only was African American men's health and, and the curtailment of their life expectancy, their less than normal life expectancy, was related to the male gender role, I learned that 
the consequences of not addressing health issues in men were reaching out to women, were affecting children, were affecting the whole of society economically. Another reason why I think it hasn't caught on is because the way we're raised as men, you know, when a boy's eight years old and he skins his knee, they tell him brave boys don't cry. When he gets hurt playing high school football, they tell him take one for the team. So when he's in his 50s having chest pain, he says that's just indigestion. Men are raised with an expectation that if something hurts, don't pay it any mind, it'll go away. And that doesn't work that well as you, as you tend to get older. So men don't complain about their health issues because they've been taught not to. And there's not enough public awareness of men's health issues for, to, to counter that. So I think that those are some of the reasons why men's health hasn't gotten attraction that it really deserves and that society could benefit tremendously if it did get. What would you say are three of the most key areas of focus in men's health that we should be working on? I would say one of, the, one of the major issues is connection to the healthcare system. I was talking about how men's health was adversely affecting women and children at Morehouse School of Medicine, and a bunch of women professors pointed out that when they were girls, they were in regular contact with the pediatrician, and as soon as they became old enough to be considered women, they were referred to the obstetrician gynecologist. So the point is there was a connection that was continued af after, their, after their childhood and adolescence all the way into adulthood. For young boys, healthcare after the pediatrics age group, when they become men, it tends to drop off the face of the earth. If you look at some studies like uh, David Salmon's Out of Touch American Men in the Healthcare System, the greatest disconnect and between men and healthcare occurs in the 18 to 29 year age group. Now, why is that important? Well. Professor Ian Banks was talking in Nice, France in 2010 at the World Congress for Men's Health, and he said the average time between the onset of symptoms and a diagnosis of diabetes in women in the United Kingdom was one year, but for men it was 10 years. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've been walking around with diabetes for 10 years, you are in a completely different situation in terms of your prognosis than if it had been diagnosed and treated promptly. Men are coming to the doctor when serious things have gone wrong with their body. They may be coming in because they're having trouble seeing because of the diabetes. They may be having trouble getting erections or something of that nature. By that time, we're, we're in a state of end organ damage, so much less can be done for them. They're in advanced disease. So when we, if you look at even even Children these days are obese. They may have high cholesterol. They they now call what we used to call what we used to call adult onset diabetes is now called type two diabetes because so many children have it now. The point is that if you walked around for decades with diabetes or undiagnosed hypertension, undiagnosed high cholesterol, undiagnosed other health problems, undiagnosed obesity, high body mass. Uh, not, not addressed, and you've walked around with that for decades, you're going to have a much poorer prognosis than if those had been ad addressed in your 20s. So one of the things we need to do is to promote a continuation of health care for males beyond the pediatric age group. Some people have suggested using sports medicine. Some people have, have suggested using other mechanisms to try to keep boys involved because if we can catch these problems early, we not only avoid premature unnecessary disability and deaths, but we avoid the tremendous health care costs of, of dealing with advanced disease. It's much cheaper to give somebody a water pill to control their blood pressure when they have mild hypertension than it is to put them on kidney dialysis uh, decades later when the hypertension has destroyed their kidneys. We're spending much more than we need to be spending because we're letting all these things go undiagnosed. Are there any other areas of men's health that you think we should be focusing on? I think we need to look at the real causes of the, of the life expectancy disparity between uh, males and females because if you look at the data, some of it looks a little strange if you want to talk about biological causes. I mean, it's been assumed that women naturally live longer than men, but if you look at that was been, been assumed since the 1950s, but men today are living longer than women did in 1950. We don't know what the upper limits of the human life expectancy are. Another issue is that it varies so much with geography. Uh, a man in Hawaii might have an li average life expectancy of 80 years. A man in Glasgow, Scotland might only live 54 years. If you look at the age distribution of mortality, uh, comparing the mortality of the genders, it's very small at the age extremes, you know, between maybe age one and four and also above age 85, there's not that much difference in mortality. The, where the difference in mortality peaks is in the 15 to 24 year age group. And that's not where biological factors are most active because uh, 
things like cancer, heart disease, how much of that do you see in 15-year-olds? How much, you know, you see some of it, but you don't see a whole heck of a lot of it. And that, I and that uh, age group is primarily injuries, uh, accidents, homicides, suicides, things of that nature uh, is, is, uh, is taking the life of people in that age group. So we really need to look at what are we doing to our young men that's creating such a mortality peak where the death rate is, is between two and three times that of females in that age group, you know, uniquely. So the point is that considering it, and another issue to consider in life expectancy is that a lot of the diseases that kill men commonly in the United States don't exist in other places or, or at much lower frequencies. Uh, in the United States, one in six men will face a diagnosis of prostate cancer. African American men, one in five. You go to Shanghai, China, it's about one one hundredth of that. Yeah. So the point is that heart disease, all the things that we see commonly here, don't, don't exist at anywhere near that frequency in other places. And in addition, a lot of the times when the people from those regions move here, they assume the American rate. So clearly something that we're doing here is causing this burden of disease, which means that a lot of it is preventable if we would just only take the time to look at it. Uh, and a final thing that I would say about uh, what needs to be improved is public awareness because have you heard people say prostrate cancer? Yes. Yeah, the point is that if you stop men in a convenience sample, you know, just question men on the street and ask them what does the prostate gland do and where is it located, maybe about half of them wouldn't be able to tell you. We've actually had a woman furious at us because she went to a health screening where we were screening prostates and she wanted to get hers checked and she doesn't have one and didn't know. I mean, the public is so ignorant about men's health issues that how can you blame men for not going to the doctor when they haven't been told what the issues are? I mean, look at all the attention that breast cancer gets and prostate cancer, which has uh, a comparable rate to breast cancer and a comparable mortality gets so much little, so much less funding and so much less attention, you know, by comparison. So the point is that let's, let's look at the issue of suicide. The average person in America does not know that suicide is two and a half times more common than homicide. But the news doesn't report that. The news doesn't report suicides. It reports homicides, you know, they, but they don't report suicide. They say that more women are diagnosed with depression. But that's paradoxical because so many more men kill themselves over four times as many. So the fact is that the public is very ignorant about the health conditions facing men. And I think that that's what leads to a lot of the lack of intervention because they don't hear it constantly. You know, advertisers will tell you they've got to hear your name about eight times before it finally sinks in. And that's why we get all this advertising. But Men's health issues are covered here and there and they're not for a long time, then again, that type of thing. And it really doesn't sink into the public that there's a lot of issues that, that there's a lot of issues that men are facing, a lot of challenges that men are facing. W one out of three women will be diagnosed with cancer in her lifetime, but one out of two men will. You know, heart disease kills men earlier than it, than it does women. If you look at the leading killers, the ten leading killers are, of human beings is defined by the Centers for Disease Control, at least nine of them are going to affect men more than women. So the point is that there are health challenges facing men, and I think that a lot of women are waking up to the fact that they have a stake in it too. A lot of women are tired of burying husbands. They're tired of, bur of burying sons. They're tired of... of, uh, of uh, if, a, if a man becomes disabled, who has to take care of him? You know, usually his wife. So the point is that they're, they're tired of the burden of caring for people and stuff. If we would pay more attention to men's health, it would help everybody. We need a four-pronged approach to community health. We need to look at men's health, women's health, children health children's health, and minority health as co-equal partners. And the failure to, dre to address any of those groups will undermine the efforts to address the others. So the point is, that's what we need is a balanced health care system. And that's why I'm in the area of men's health. All right. Dr. Bonhomme, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you we for having it. me.